Hej allihopa, hjärtligt välkomna till Forskning i framkant. Och jag heter Ola Wahlström och är ortoped, men det kommer inte att handla om någon ortopedi idag. Utan vi har äran att hälsa välkommen Tine Jarsma som är professor i omvårdnad. She prefers to speak English in her speak, though she speaks excellent Swedish. Tine Jarsma has made uh, important contribution to, to the research on evidence-based medicine on uh, caring sciences, uh, particularly uh, heart failure. Please. Thank you. Tack så mycket. I'm very happy today to talk about my favorite subject. It's uh, self-care, uh, quality of life and heart failure. I put this uh, slide in just to uh, illustrate that I am a professor here at uh, Liu and I work at the beautiful campus North Shipping and I do a lot of research in the area of living with heart disease. So not actually about what is heart disease and how is the heart working, but if people have a heart disease, how is it to live with heart failure and how is it to have a good life with heart failure? So I'd like to start with a slide which I also will end with because it, we often in science say like we have a, a take home message. So I already give the take home message and the take home message I would like, if you remember this talk is about if you have a heart disease, prevent worsening. That is something we, we work very hard in, uh, on in caring sciences. Self care is key, is very important. I will discuss that and always try to find a good life. And of course, that's not only for heart failure patients, it's probably for us all to find the good life. And just to start with that, living a good life, uh, what is that? What is living a good life? So I started first out to find definitions of quality of life, but that is often yeah, very far away from our feeling. And I think if I talk to patients and if I talk to people uh, with heart disease, people want to be still happy, want to have a good quality of life, uh, a good well-being. Joy is also a terminology, what fits into living a good life. Contentment, be happy, content with life. And probably more things that you would think this would be a good quality of life for me. So th actually that's the concept that I would like to work with uh, during this lecture is probably everybody has an idea what is a good life. And that's what we try to work with our patients to, to live the life that is good as they define it. For example, this patient uh, said, as long as I can do some fishing every week, I feel my life is good. This is actually a, a person who was 100 years old. And um, he said, after my heart attack, I'm afraid to sit there alone at the fishing site. So that really was important in his life. This old uh, lady said, it's very important that I still can wash and dress myself. And do, I do not want to be dependent on others. And you probably rec recognize that a lot of us don't like to be dependent on others. Even with my heart failure, she told me, I still can do this, which makes me happy. This younger woman with uh, heart disease said, I want to be able to take care of my children as long as I can. Even now, when having a pacemaker, I realize how lucky I am. So that's also not, not some, something to say that even if you have heart disease, if you have a pacemaker, you still enjoy life and have important goals in life. And the last one I think is very uh, suitable now. We enter the winter in Sweden. Uh, I do not feel good if I cannot take my own snow from the pavement. And this patient actually said, I hate having heart failure because that limited him really to do this job, which made him feel very, very happy or very uh, uh, good uh, with a good quality of life. So these are some examples. And then, of course, when we go to healthcare and our research, we often focus on lowering blood pressure, 
um, having a longer life, decreasing readmissions, and I will talk about that too. But often I think it is important to look at, is for this patient, is it important to have a lower blood pressure or to have more vitality so he can uh, uh, do, th or he or she can do things. Should this patient want to live longer or a better life? Having a higher heart rate or be less depressed? So often the endpoints or the, the goals we work in in research are different also in my, my kind of research. And, uh, uh, and I'm happy to talk about that. These are also important endpoints for our patients. So what I would cover today is heart disease and its consequences for daily life. Uh, the role of self-care uh, and research in self-care that I am engaged in now with a group of researchers here at LIU. So first, and I will not give a lot of pictures of the heart, I first had them in, but of course then I realized that is not really the focus of my talk because I want to talk about how to live with heart, or with heart disease. But of course some basics we need to understand why people maybe have symptoms or maybe why people have a uh, worse quality of life. So the heart, as we all know, it pumps the blood through the blood vessels in all the different tissues to the, to the body. Uh, and this blood carries water, oxygen and nutrients. And blood is also important for removing waste products from the body. So a very basic description, but actually if you think about it, this, you only have one heart, uh, at least most of us, and this is needed to live, but also are, are, are important to stress that it's needed to breathe, to move around, to do things, but also things to make contacts, to eat and drink, to have energy, to work, to think. So you need this heart to do the things in life that are important for us all. So if you take this row and then put them in the green, which you need, and you could see if people have maybe uh, a cardiac arrest or they have a uh, myocardial infarction or they have arrhythmia or heart failure, people get these kind of symptoms. So they cannot breathe as they want. So they get short of breath. They become dependent. They want to move around like the lady in the slide, but they become dependent. They might feel isolated. A loss of appetite, we see also a lot in, in patients, cardiac patients, tired, fatigue. Um, people go on sick leave. They have to change jobs sometimes. Some people have less ability to think or to get their thoughts in the right order. Uh, cognitive dysfunction. Pain, we see a lot with uh, heart failure or heart, uh, cardiac patients. People feel frightened, like the man in the slide that wanted to go fishing and could not do that anymore because he felt frightened. Maybe he would have another heart attack. So these symptoms people have to live with. So a little bit about heart failure, because I will talk a lot about it. And there are a lot of cardiac diseases, but the research I do is often with patients with heart failure, and heart failure means it's in, in Swedish, yet yeah, svikt. So it's a condition which the heart cannot pump enough blood into the body to do all these things like having uh, energy, uh, people feel often tired, etc. So the heart cannot pump enough blood to, the, to see to the, the body's tissues need. And with too little blood being delivered, the organs and other tissues do not receive enough oxygen and nutrients to function, function properly. So patients with heart failure often are very tired. Uh, they have sometimes keep fluid in the body because the heart cannot get it out. So they might have, like this lady, uh, fluids in the ankles. Uh, so that is the, the patient group I work with a lot, patients with heart failure. And you can get heart failure um, from maybe having uh, arrhythmia or maybe having have a, a, a myocardial infarction in the past. Uh, but actually, I don't focus a lot on how they get heart failure, but people have to live with heart failure. And so they have heart failure, but there's a lot of treatments, medication, surgery, uh, people can have uh, ablations for to, to have their uh, rhythm to have their rhythm restored. Some people get devices, pacemakers, defibrillators, 
Some people get a heart transplant, so there are a lot of treatments, and we're very happy for that. But also we realize that these treatments can also affect the quality of life of patients. If you have to take medications every day, some people don't like that. They, some people say, I don't want to be confronted with this disease every day. I have to take medication every day. Uh, surgery, of course, is, it's very intense for patients to have this. So the heart disease influences quality of life, but also the treatments. So a little bit about heart fa failure. And often people ask uh, me, and then, what then? Can I still, should I, or should I not? And I, I give you some examples, and, and these are the areas uh, that we do a lot of research in. Uh, could people still do this and that? And I give some examples. For example, can I still eat and drink? And probably if you look in the press and everywhere, you, you, we, we read a lot that coffee is good for the heart, coffee is bad for the heart. So if you have a cardiac disease, should you stop drinking coffee? This has been a very uh, hot in the press that we have to eat more chocolate, dark chocolate, because that's good for the heart. Should we only cook with olive oil like they do in the Mediterranean diet? Should we stop eating eggs because there is so much cholesterol in it? Should we stop eating salt or maybe have a little salt? Uh, lose weight, uh, restrict fluids, so not have a lot of uh, uh, water during the day. Or maybe just drink a lot of water. Uh, drink wine or not? So these are all questions that come up if you have a chronic disease and especially if you have a cardiac disease that people would think, can I still do all these things? The other one is also uh, important. Uh, can, I still, can I still exercise? Can I still sport? Can I still work? So if you have a cardiac disease, and this is what we also study and, and, uh, and look at, should people be on sick leave right away? Should people rest the whole day and stay in bed? Or should they exercise as much as possible? And I will come back to that uh, a little later. Maybe people should find a calm hobby and stop uh, exciting sports or hobbies or not, or just maybe go on with their lives. So these are questions that people come up with when having a heart disease, can I still do these things? And just an example in how we study that is that we, with a bigger group, we looked at a lot of countries, and here you can see Netherlands, my, where I'm originally from, UK, France, and uh, Sweden, uh, that we uh, asked the general public, should the heart failure patient, should he rest or do exercise? And the general public found a heart failure patient should live uh, quietly and avoid physical exertion, so physical exercise. And here you could see in the Netherlands, around 40% of the general public finds, yes, people with heart failure should just sit and live a quiet life. And of course, that changes a lot from country to country. And what we then see is this is from our uh, professional guidelines that we write about heart failure. And in the professional guidelines, it said the opposite. It's recommended that regular exercise is encouraged in patients with heart failure to improve functional capacity and symptoms. So the general public, and that's probably you and I and our neighbors, a lot of people find, no, no, if you have a heart disease, you should sit and be calm. But actually, it's the opposite. Another can I still. Can I still have sex? And I've been in the press lately a lot about that, but uh, I will not talk too much about that uh, today. But. Um, a lot of questions that come up with patients is, if you have a cardiac disease, should you never have sex again? Only have sex carefully? Just have sex as usual, even in the case of, uh, in the case of chest pain, so if you have pain, just go on. Be afraid of dying of a heart attack. Be afraid to damage the pacemaker, maybe. Maybe not take Viagra, or should you take Viagra? So these are all questions that come up with living with heart disease. And we recently had a very nice, and I, that's also part of my research work, is a, a statement on sexual counseling. What should we tell patients with heart disease about this topic? And um, 
I've been in uh, in Koren, so I d will not play the mu m movie, but it uh, was a Swedish uh, uh, interview also about why is it so important that we discuss this subject. And uh, for example, if we do not discuss this subject, pa patients might just maybe think and read, okay, this, is, this can cause impotence, I will not take it anymore. So maybe they skip the medication, feel afraid to start sex again. Maybe online order uh, Viagra or something and maybe they cannot, have to, cannot take it together with other medication. Maybe have side effects of other treatments or feel a decreased quality of life. So I think it is very important uh, that we as healthcare providers discuss it, but also study uh, what's the best way to how to address it. And I always like this slide that, you know, a good quality of life is, is very important and for everybody that's very different. So I go back to can I still have, can I still do? These things we discuss uh, a lot and study is if you have a cardiac disease, should you always take the medication of, as prescribed or can you just skip one or two? Uh, should you always stop smoking? Yes. Should you check for symptoms? Should you avoid stress? Should you avoid other people? Well, maybe if they smoke, I would think. But um, so these things are also in the, 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 the yeah, in, in coping with a heart disease. So just to give an example how complicated it can be for a patient. This is the self-care that we as healthcare providers often recommend to patients with heart failure. Take medications and that could be 4 to 12 pieces a day to exercise, to monitor symptoms, for example to, to step on the weighing scale every day and see if you increase in weight and if it's too much weight it could be fluids in the body so people have to to do something. So recognize the rapid weight gain. Understand the cause of heart failure and why you have symptoms. Know when and why to or how and when to notify healthcare providers. Maybe use uh, your medication a little bit more flexible. Uh, if for example people have more fluids in the body maybe they should take uh, more or other medication. Understand indication and dosing of drugs, and these are often a lot. Recognize the common side effects of drugs. Understand the importance of stop smoking, monitor blood pressure, avoid obesity, sodium restriction, so not to have too much salt, and on and on. And this is only if, pe people, are if, if people only have heart failure. So you can see the list if you have also diabetes or maybe lung disease. So this is uh, often confusing to a lot of patients that have to weigh and take medication. And this is actually the first page of the patient education booklet of the Netherlands Heart Foundation, which helps us to educate and, uh, uh, patients and their partners on uh, how to live with heart failure. <coughs> So how does all this fit in research and theory that we do? Because these, of, th of course, are thoughts that come up. But how do I use it, or our group uses it, in, in theory? And then I would like to introduce to you the concept of self-care. What is self-care? Well, self-care is actually what we do a lot. We brush our teeth, we eat healthy food. Um, so it's the the most common form of medical and healthcare in the world. Most individuals like you and me only are one or two hours a year with the healthcare provider and some of us more and some of us less and say well I never go to the doctor, I've never been there for the last five years but most individuals are not going to the doctor a lot and the other waking hours we do self-care, we take care of ourselves. So the World Health Organization says, defines self-care as activities that individuals, families and communities undertake either separately or in collaboration with professionals with the intention to improve health, prevent disease, limiting illness and restoring health. 
So I, I would stay a little bit with this definition because it's a lot of things that we do to restore, that we want to maintain health or prevent disease. And you see the toothbrush here is that what we do to, pre, to stay, have healthy uh, uh, teeth. We uh, spore to stay healthy, we eat healthy, etc. But self-care in, uh, if you have a disease, then self-care is getting to another level. You take your medication, you maybe have a diet, you look for your symptoms. And that is the concept we work with a lot, or maybe people with diabetes have to uh, control their own blood sugar, etc. So why now we should focus on self-care? And I think we need to. We need to because we have an increasing number of chronic patients. Uh, we all get older and uh, we get more diseases. And also the diseases that we have, maybe in the earlier days we died from them, but nowadays we live longer, so more people live with chronic disease. This is a burden to patients and families, uh, and I don't mean that in a bad sense that we're burdening, the, the, that the patients are a burden to us, but the disease is a burden to the patient and often to the family. And the whole care is also a burden to our health care. We have so many people and patients coming in that we need to look differently also on what can we provide people and what do people really need. Why also focus on self-care, for example, the changing profile of our patients. Our patients, like I said, are getting more uh, older, but often don't have only one disease, uh, maybe only heart failure or lung disease. They often have combinations. But also, uh, there is a, more a call for autonomy of a lot of patients. Um, patients want to do more self-care. And I always think about an example of my own father, who has had a, uh, a replacement of his valve in the heart, and therefore he needs to take medication to keep his blood thin. And in the Netherlands, then you have to go to a healthcare professional every six weeks to have your blood checked, and then you get a schedule how you have to take this uh, medication. And my father said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to this doctor every four, maybe six weeks, and then be dependent. I want to travel, I want to be on the camping. Can't I do it myself? So we found out there is this machine that you can take your own blood uh, and uh, you can send it to the hospital. But still he was not happy. So he went to a course, so he learned to do make his own dosing on, uh, um, on basis on his uh, the blood he took fr from uh, every day, uh, of checking his blood every day. So because he said, I don't want to be dependent on the healthcare system. I want to do self-care. So it's not always something that we push on our patients. More and more, we want to live our own lives. We want to travel, we want to be in Sommerstuga and not need to travel to the university hospital. So, so that is also why we now uh, move a little bit more to self-care. And also our profile in healthcare is changing. The roles of doctors, nurses, physical therapists are sometimes blending a little bit in, in each other. We have a more multidisciplinary approach where the patient is part of the team. So we have a different view on, on care. There is a, a large call for prevention that we prevent being sick or also prevent getting worse. And also a call for efficiency. Uh, like, for example, if you now go to the hospital for knee or hip surgery, you're not in the hospital anymore for two weeks, etc. It's much quicker and people are asked also to do more themselves. So the changing profile of the patients, I already talked a little bit about that people try to cope with their illness and in integrate in daily life. And this is an example I, I have from a British uh, site, is that people are organized more, patients are organized more, uh, people are in support groups. And also here is a nice course for young people, getting sorted, self-care workshop for young people. So we're moving in that direction of self-care. Together with uh, colleagues from uh, here from Lynchburg University, Professor Anna Stromberg and our visiting professor 
from Pennsylvania, Professor Barbara Regal, who is here, uh, we developed a theory from all the work we did. We, we've been in this area for 25 years, um, all of us, and we developed a model or a theory that we can look at this chronic illness and self-care. And it's not like very complex, but it helps us to plan our care for patients and to develop our research. And it, it, it contains of these three, uh, th three concepts, self-care maintenance, self-care monitoring, and self-care management. So to go a little bit in the theory, I will not bore you too much with the theory, but just to understand how we work with that is that what we said, like the, the WHO, self-care is a process of ma maintaining health through health-promoting practices and managing illness. So here we shift away from the toothbrushing to, to, to stay healthy, but also to manage your health and, and keep healthy with your disease, actually. It focused on the process of self-care. Uh, for example, uh, we look which behaviors and processes are used by individuals dealing with the chronic disease. So we actually research and ask patients, what do you do to, to be uh, in your self-care? It's focused on the individual, and like I said, these key concepts are maintenance, monitoring, and management. And I will give some examples on that. So if you look at maintenance, what are, is maintenance? Maintenance is those behaviors used by patients with a chronic illness to maintain physical and emotional stability. So what do we do not to get worse, or at least to stay stable? And for example, in heart failure, the things we have to do then, our patients have to do, is take the medication, so medication adherence, also get a yearly flu shot. So if the flu comes, that we will, uh, the people will not get more sick and deteriorate in their heart failure. Exercise, like I showed before, is an also a very important self-care maintenance, so to stay stable. The next, uh, part of the theory addresses the self-care monitoring. And the monitoring is the process of observing oneself for changes in signs and symptoms. So what happens with my body? What happens? Do I get my, are my ankles uh, getting uh, more swollen? Or so, and we also say monitor weight. So a lot of patients with heart failure weigh themselves regularly and uh, they check for if they have edema in the legs or somewhere else, if they have maybe more chest pain, maybe have a higher or lower heart rate. So these are, it's part of self-care, but it's quite different than only taking your medication or doing a diet. This is actually very active and looking for how is my body responding. And then the third one would be the response to signs and symptoms when they occur. So what should the person do if he has this two kilo gain? Uh, should he call the doctor? Should he call an ambulance? Should he take other medication? So that is what we call self-care management. And in heart failure, for example, this is what I told before, changing diuretics. We learn patients, if you have a weight gain and it's fluid of more than two uh, kilos, you can increase your uh, diuretics, the pills that take the water out of your body once, uh, or one extra, or two extra, depending on the patient. So that's really the self-care management that maybe in earlier days people would go to the doctor or wait for three weeks until uh, he had an appointment with the doctor, uh, but now we teach patients to be very active. It's the same with the, of course, with diabetes patients who change their insulin based on their sugar level. Or maybe call a doctor and nurse if you have certain symptoms. Or maybe call an ambulance, but to learn how to react. So this is the model we developed and we use it in our research uh, and also in our, our patient care actually. And we actually look at what can self-care do for us. And we found that if you have good self-care, patients can have less symptoms, uh, better functional status, do more, better survival, it costs us less as society, and patients are having a, a, bigger a larger quality of life, a better quality of life. And that brings me actually to give some examples of my current research that I do here 
with uh, my colleagues at uh, Liu. And I have four uh, studies I would like to, to share with you shortly. And it's on the effect of self-care. Uh, self-care around the world, because we're here in Sweden, but of course we have uh, a, a big world around us, but also a lot of people from other cultures coming here that maybe have a different view on self-care. Self-care in the internet and self-care and technology. So to go back on the effects of self-care. So what can self-care do for us? And I worked with a group uh, in, the, in the Netherlands and I'm also here that we found that if people do good self-care, people will stay out of the hospital longer. Uh, what we did is uh, we had a big group of patients, around 1,000 patients, and we asked them for their self-care. We asked them, do you restrict your fluid, which we often advised in heart failure patients, not drink more than two liters of water a day, sodium restriction, exercise, and daily weight, so the monitoring of symptoms. And patients could have a score from zero to four. So if they did nothing, they had a score of zero. And if they all did all the four things, they had a, a score of four. And what we saw is that if patients did these things, the overall compliance, we called it, so if they did all the four things, what we saw is that the days that people were either uh, readmitted in the hospital or maybe did not even live anymore, these days were uh, much less if people um, were uh, actually not doing the self-care. So if people were not compliant and they did not these uh, four issues, uh, four items, people were more often re-hospitalized or even had died earlier. So, and this is also a nice uh, uh, example to see that if people did the four uh, behaviors, 25% of the patients were readmitted within half an, uh, one and a half year, 18 months. So that's still a lot. One in four of the patients were, had to go to the hospital within one and a half a year. But if people did nothing of these four behaviors, this almost doubled. So if people did the behaviors, they really uh, did better. So that's one of the things self-care can do for us. And, and we study here now too, what is a very good way to help people to, to, to uh, well, stay motivated to do self-care. Self-care around the world, that's a, a very exciting project I'm working now and, uh, with now. And um, what we did is we looked at 15 countries in the world um, and we compared the self-care behaviors in these 15 countries. And a lot of the researchers here uh, used uh, a, a, a method to see if patients uh, took care of themselves or not. And then we looked, is there differences between Israel, Japan, Sweden, the Netherlands? And it was very uh, interesting to see how uh, all these researchers in over the whole world actually are interested in the concept of self-care. With that study, what we aimed was to describe the self-care internationally to learn from each other. And we had also these items you recognized from the previous, and we added also the flu shot, because that's also the yearly flu, flu shot, very important. And uh, of course, I cannot give all the results, but just I give you just an illustration, and I know this is very busy, but I, this is all the countries that were involved. And Sweden was involved three times, because we had three researchers from Sweden giving us data. And on this slide, you can see this is 0 to 100. And this is the percentage of people who did not do good self-care in this example exercise. So if you could see the Italians who are on top, there is about almost 100% of the people with heart failure did not do exercise. Uh, and also Brazil, Hong Kong, a very high percentage of patients with heart failure who did not exercise. Uh, and we did in this study, we did don't know why, because maybe they didn't find it important, maybe they did not have the facilities. Sweden was quite high in one of the populations, uh, and that was a population of very, very sick uh, patients. So of course, they cannot go out and uh, do uh, exercise every day. Uh, but other populations we had in Sweden did a little better. Uh, and the Germans, who is surprised, they did 
the best. They were very exercising and, and felt very, um, are, uh, did, did good self-care in, uh, uh, um, in that way. I was just looking where the Netherlands is here. And this was uh, about diet. And then you can also see how, ch how it is changes with, uh, within countries. Because also in, uh, a lot of people in Sweden were very uh, good in self-care with the diet and had healthy diet, did not eat too much salt, did, did high self-care. So th because these are the people who uh, had low self-care. So why do we do this? We learn on how important uh, it is to, for example, have good food for a low price available, also that people know, and also that people have entrance. For example, if we want to have a flu shot for every person, then it should be easy to get it, it should be easy, uh, people should not have to pay large amounts of money for it. And luckily, of course, we have that in Sweden. So another project we work on with self-care is self-care in the internet. And uh, the aim of that study is actually to improve self-care by internet education. Can we really improve that by internet education? Or do we need to sit face with, to face with patients? Or do we need to give a good brochure? How can we use the internet? So what we did with the big group is we developed a website internationally. And uh, it was translated in several languages. And now we are testing it. And it is, uh, this uh, website is called heartfailurematters.org. And uh, it's uh, here we have uh, Anna, and that's the virtual guide that helps you through the, through the internet. And this is all the issues that people have to learn about. Understanding heart failure, what can your doctor do, what can you do, living with heart failure caregivers, warning signs, for example. And if you click on warning signs, you will get into which warning signs? Shortness of breath, cough, fainting, etc. So this uh, website we developed, and um, it's now available in, in English, uh, Spanish, Russian, German, etc. Not in Sweden yet, because we need to find a good funding agency who will translate it into Sweden. But it is very nice to use, even if you um, would like to look at the, the films that are there, or the tools that people can download. But anyway, not to make uh, an advertisement for a website, but just to see how we now work with this, is that we have a study going in Europe and that people, some people get access to this website and others are not. And we're testing their knowledge and we're testing their self-care. So just to see, is this a good tool to use? Or was it just a nice idea from some uh, researchers that worked, we worked with patients and, and uh, caregivers to, to develop it? But maybe it's not a, a, a medium that we want to use. And then the, the final project I'm uh, very enthusiastic about is our using technology to improve self-care. And therefore we, u we use a, uh, I will give the example of our heart failure, we study. And um, this is a, a study that's been done uh, by one of my doctoral students, uh, Leonie. Virtual reality to increase, ex increase exercise capacity of heart failure patients. And uh, because we talked about it before, that exercise is very important. But you can imagine if you're tired, if you have heart failure, or if it's snowing outside, or it's slippery outside, you are not going to do staff gong, or you're not going to walk through the woods. But we still think it's important that people feel that they exercise and they feel safe to exercise. So what we did is to uh, use the Nintendo Wii game computer. We used that as a tool to, uh, to see if we can use games. And for us, of course, it's not, Im it's not important if it's the Wii or the PlayStation or the, or the whatever. We want to see the concept if using a virtual games is valuable uh, for elderly heart failure patients to get more exercise. It's a very nice uh, study. This is the, actually the we for, uh, for, for the ones who, uh, who do not uh, know it. It is uh, a little box you put on the TV and you have this remote control like this and you, you use it as a bowling ball or a tennis racket. 
uh, and you could do diff different games. And what we do is, we here have an instructor and a patient, uh, and in Vrinivik Hukuc, in uh, North Shipping, we use this uh, study, and we will uh, soon start also here in uh, Lin Shipping and Yun Shipping, that we bring patients uh, to the hospital for a session of about one or two hours, and they have instructions uh, from a, uh, a Wii instructor, and uh, this person will tell how to do it, how to do the games, and then uh, this person goes home to the patient and installs everything and again goes through it. Uh, and yeah, so it's like because every TV is different and every uh, room is different because we have to be uh, safe. So we have safety guidelines that people will not fall over um, little uh, things in the house or hit the lamp, etc. So we have safety guidelines and then uh, people can use the Wii. So we did a little pilot of uh, 32 patients and see, this, does this work and do people like it? And this is from the pilot study. So 32 patients, uh, all but one patient, they could uh, uh, successfully play on the Wii. And one patient was so sick and he could actually only sit on a chair and not move a lot. So for him it was not uh, feasible and, and, and not nice to do this uh, Wii. But the rest of the patients, they uh, played the Wii successfully. Our mean age was around 75. People had no difficulties following the safety guidelines. We had no injuries. And more than 50%, so more than half, improved the physical activity they did. And we measured that really objectively um, in their daily life. And uh, so we said people are motivated to do it, they can use it, and they can improve their physical capacity. And what we have as a little side effect is that the idea of the study was that people should use the Wii for the project three months and then give it back to us so we could give it to other patients. But 10 patients, they, they did not want to give the Wii back because they wanted to, to keep it and they wanted to use it for exercising. They still have it. Um, so the next step we do now, and we're in the middle of that, we're recruiting for a bigger study. Because a pilot study with people that are maybe motivated might work, but we would say if we give it to um, patients that are selected, uh, or that, that are not selected, that are just taken from the heart failure clinic, and we give them the we, and the other group will not get the we. So we will have an intervention group, we, and we have a control group, and then we have three months, six months, and uh, 12 months. So after one year, we do a follow up and see if people improve. Do they actually exercise more? Uh, do they feel better with the Wii? Uh, and do they maybe get into more activities that they would not only go bowling with the Wii, but also think, well, now I feel um, uh, at ease to do more exercise. Maybe I can go out and, and have a longer walk. So that's the study we're working on now and uh, was partly funded also by Wetenskap Srodet. So we're very excited about that. And Let's see. So as you see, as this lady, she has the Wii, and, and what we actually also try to do now is set up bowling competitions, not really, but virtual, between uh, uh, different uh, elder in, uh, in North Shipping. So we're working on that project. So, so we feel this, is, this virtual gaming might be very nice to, to test and to introduce. So that concludes actually what can self-care do for us, like what I told, people can have less symptoms, feel better, live longer, and live a better quality of life. Which brings me to my first and last slide, I promised you, is that of course when having a heart disease, that is not of course good, but if you have it, prevent worsening, we're working, working very hard with patients to do that. Self-care is key. And always is, of course, try to find a good life, healthy or sick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was thinking about the control group in this, uh, the WEE study. Are they performing any exercise as well as the... Uh yeah, well, it's a very good question because, of course, we, 
We don't say to them, you cannot sit, or, uh, but we give them also an advice to be active. Uh, to, we give them an advice to be active 20 minutes a day and the same we give to the, the wee patient, 20 minutes, half an hour a day. So we would say that, please, that's a good for you. So we will give the advice, but we will not give the, the equipment to do it and the extra help. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any adverse effects of this uh, uh, treatment? Uh, I could imagine that uh, uh, patients get worried if they don't manage to do all these things that they should do. Yeah. And they get uh, fear, oh, I have done something wrong now. Or yes, that, you mean the whole self-care idea. Yeah. And that's actually very, um, a very good remark because we have all these things that they have to do. And sometimes people even feel guilty if they are hospitalized. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, one patient once said to me, I did everything you said, but I'm still hospitalized. And that, of course, happens because the heart, if you have heart failure, the heart will not go, go uh, become better. Uh, so, and I think, therefore, we have this approach that it's not you, you have to do it, otherwise we think you are, otherwise you will get this and that. I think it is important to... Um, to, yeah, to, how say, to, to involve the patient in this and say this is what often happens, this is how you can take care of yourself. But of course also invite them that if they cannot do it or even I, I believe if they want, do not want to do it, that they have of course always the right and that you have to be creative to see um, how you can help. For example, I had once a patient that we said you have to weigh every day and he said I don't want to weigh every day. I come from my bed, I feel like a good person, then I have to step on this scale and I feel sick right away. Mm -hmm. So then what should you say? You have to wait, so that's good self-care. No, that's not, we said like, what, but what are you, uh, we, because we of course said like, we, we would like you to monitor if you have fluid in your body, therefore it's the weight. Mm -hmm. Are there other things? And he said, well, I can, I, it's fine for me to check if I go up to the stairs, if I get more short of breath or if I have fluid in my ankles, that I can do for you. So that's, I think, fine. That's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, I have another question. I, I'm not sure that I should put it, but anyway, my a former boss of mine, when I was uh, young and uh, very polite, and uh, he was about my age, and I asked him uh, what he has been doing during his holiday. And he said, uh, the usual, wine and women. <laughs> what would happen to him if he got a heart failure? What, what would you say to him? <laughs> well, it, it's, that's, uh, yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I would just uh, say that he would just still enjoy the wine and women. <laughs> But what I would also say is to take very good care and also feel how you feel about it. And um, for example, if people have certain medication, uh, they might uh, maybe have, uh, uh, for example, if they have uh, chest pain and they have uh, uh, chest pain and they take, for example, Viagra, that's very dangerous. So that I should say, don't do that at least. But uh, if people have had a heart attack, they could have sex again. That's, that's no problem. So it's, uh, but it's often the thoughts we have, it's not possible. Or, but actually, if you think about how much energy it takes to have sex, it's the same as going up two flights of stairs. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all. Mm -hmm. So it might be disappointing for us, but that's the amount of energy it takes from the heart. So that's often a practical thing, what we say. If you can... Uh, walk up two flights of stairs without okay. complaints, then you can have sex. Okay. And yeah. about the wine? The wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we say one glass of wine is, is if, if you have heart failure, you can have still one glass of wine a day. Yes, okay. yeah. Unless uh, people have, sometimes people get heart failure by drinking too much wine. So they have this called this alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. So they get actually heart disease from the alcohol. Then we would say, people are really uh, uh, advised not to drink anymore. 
But if that's not the, uh, the underlying cause, people can have one glass of wine a day. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you.